Sing a little louder. 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 We will praise a little louder. Praise a little louder. Praise a little louder. Praise a little louder.
built up, every wall I've built up, every wall I've built up. Cause you deserve every piece of my heart, every piece of my heart, every piece of my heart. Lord, I am trusting that you are a faithful father and all that you have it is good. You're a generous giver, your love's like no other. Won't you come and break through to me? Over and over and over again, I am bringing my heart to you with open hands. Closer and closer, you're drawing me in as the depths of my heart lay before you.
make that our prayer. Every wall I built up, every wall I built up, cause you deserve, you deserve every it, Lord. Every piece of mine, every piece of mine, every Let's sing it one more time. Come, come and tear down the walls I built up, every wall I built up, every wall I built up, cause you deserve every piece of my heart. Every piece of my heart, every piece of my heart. Now, will you just pray that right now? God, tear down every wall. Tear down any wall in my heart. Remove any obstacle, any stronghold. Remove any distraction and any hindrance, oh God. For you deserve every part of me. You deserve, Lord, every part of my heart. Every piece of it, God, belongs to you. Pray and ask right now that there be a freedom, Lord, and a liberty in the priest's word and a receptivity to it. Lord Jesus, let it fall on good soil. The rain fall in Jesus' name. We praise you and thank you for it. And now will you give God some praise with your mouth and with a hand clap. Come on, let's give him a shout of praise with our mouth, Lord. We worship you. No one like you, God. praise you Jesus amen doesn't it feel good in God's house today oh thank you Jesus praise God I'm so thankful for it and it's so good to see all of you this Sunday and we have had two tremendous services already this weekend and I'm so thankful for that anybody hungry for God today Amen. Why don't you just turn and wave at somebody that maybe you haven't talked to in a little while. Wave at one another, smile, maybe say, hey, good to see you. But greet one another. That's our greeting at the moment. But it's so good to have all of you here. Any first-time guests, we're honored that you're here with us. Amen. God bless you. You can be seated. Thank you for being here today. You know, Heather and I, Ava, we moved in um, a new home three and a half years ago, I guess. And beginning of this year, after three and a half years, there's places around our house that still looks like the desert. I mean, it's just dry and desolate and no grass and, and um, barren. And so I got tired of it. And I told Heather, I said, I am determined this year to get some grass to grow. Because she had been telling me, I'm tired of seeing dirt. I'm tired of seeing dirt. <laughs> Don't act like you weren't saying that. <laughs> and I was right there with her. I was tired of seeing it too. And So this spring, I decided, well, I'd, I'd research and read and watch the pros and when they planted and what they planted and how they planted and what they did and so I've been watching, learning, trying to research it. And so spring, I started to work on it. Of course, you know, pandemic hit, gave me some time to be able to do this. And so I started getting the seed and started, you know, weeding and seeding and fertilizing and trying to get it to work but you know the most important part of that whole process do y'all know what the most important part of that process is after I've done all that water watering a lot of watering and we don't have a small yard so I couldn't water it all so I watered what I could around the house and then I just prayed for rain because the best thing for it is a natural rain. A natural rain. Matter of fact, a thunderstorm's even better. They say something in the atmosphere, and I don't know. But it's, it's beyond me, but they say it's great for it. And so I would just pray. And that, wouldn't you know, we had like two months of nothing but rain. Y'all remember that? It was just rain, rain, rain. And as soon as I did that, the drought hit. And I thought, Lord, do you, 
are you trying to tell me something that, that you not want me to have green grass around here? Is it, am I going to take too much pride in it? What is it? I don't know what it is, but we're still working and I'm still praying. I need y'all to pray with me. It does look better, but it's still not there yet. But you know, here lately, there have been some spots that had come up good and then it'd die off in the heat and a bit back and forth. But after a good rain, I was driving home one day, Heather, we were all in the car, and I said, Heather, look at that yard. Doesn't it look nice? It's so green and lush and, oh my goodness, I'm so, now you, you're reaching a certain stage in life when you celebrate how good the grass looks, okay? I'm telling on myself a little bit right there. But I was excited, Brother Matt, because there was some grass where there hadn't been grass before. And I was excited. And as I began to give this some thought this week again, as I began to look at all the dry spots again and frustration, I began to parallel this with our spiritual lives. And you know, when the Spirit of God falls like rain in us, it brings life back to us. And I feel like we need the rain to fall again and revive some things that have become dormant and dead in our lives. In, in my research, I recently I came across a documentary by Ken Burns. It's been out for a while where he describes the worst dust storm to hit our continent. Some of you have heard about it. It was in the 1930s. And what the stock market collapse did to the industrial areas, the dust storm did to some rural areas. Before the storm, a combination of, of drought and poor farming methods had led to an erosion of topsoil. And when the high winds came, the loosened topsoil began to take flight. And much of the Great Plains and Midwest were heavily affected. Following the terrible dust storm on April the 14th, 1935, a reporter named this area the Dust Bowl. Anybody ever heard of the Dust Bowl happening back in the 1930s? And topsoil from this territory was carried and deposited over 1,500 miles to the east coast of the United States. What was an inconvenience to the eastern United States was devastation to the farmers and people who inhabited this area called the Dust Bowl. Farms were blanketed with dust. Dust mounds like you would see snow mounds and crops perished in the field and livestock died. This era is described in John Steinbeck's classic Grapes of Wrath. Steinbeck de describes people coming out of their houses and watching as their livelihood was rubbed out by the dry grit of a storm. Many were broke, revenues plummeted, farms were foreclosed on, people were turned out to the elements or forced to leave and try their luck somewhere else, all during the Great Depression. And it was one of the most massive migrations in U.S. history. The Dust Bowl forced tens of thousands of poverty-stricken families to abandon their farms, unable to pay mortgages or grow crops, and the losses reached $25 million per day by 1936. That is the equivalent to $460 million today. The drought officially ended in 1941, just as the country was plunged into the second World War. And you know the cure for the Dust Bowl? It came in the form of rain. Rain clouds put dust clouds back in their place. And so I want to preach to you with the help of the Lord for a few minutes today. When it rains. Hosea 6, chapter 6, verse 1 through 3. It says, come and let us return to the Lord, for he has torn, but he will heal us. He has stricken, 
but he will bind us up. After two days, he will revive us. On the third day, he will raise us up that we may live in his sight. Let us know. Let us pursue the knowledge of the Lord. His going forth is established as the morning. And he will come to us like the rain, like the latter and the former rain to the earth. We look around at our world today and we say, so much dust. For such times, the greatest need of our day is a heaven-sent revival rain. We could use some revival rain in this nation, in our lives, in our church. We need a revival of the word. Psalms 119, 107, the psalmist said, I am afflicted very much. Revive me, O Lord, according to your word. Psalms 119.37 speaks of we need a revival in God's ways. It says, turn away my eyes from looking at worthless things and revive me in your way. Worthless things distract us from being revived in God's ways. So we need to pray, God, send us a revival rain to where we turn our eyes upon you and quit looking to worthless things. We need a revival in calling upon the name of the Lord. For when we turn away from worthless things, we will cry, revive us in Psalms 80, 18, and we will call upon your name. And if God's people seek after such a revival, if we turn to his word, if we modify our ways and our behaviors and we call on his name, I believe that a heaven sent revival is coming to us. The rain will fall. Now I want to say right here that some people think that they are okay with their lives right now. So how do we know if we need revival? One of the most curious things about God's people is that like Samson, we do not realize when God's power is no longer with us. We assume that he's still moving and working in our lives and the absence of something taken for granted is not soon missed. And only calamity reveals that God's power has gone missing in our lives. The cutting edge of spiritual effectiveness can be dulled and we don't even realize it. Spiritual deterioration sets in. Erosion carves ruts of routines into the soul's landscape and drought enters into our lives. So how do we know when it is time for a revival reign in our lives? We have become dry and in need of some revival reign when complacency is the norm and it's accepted. When we are tempted to be at ease in Zion, when we are tempted to be at ease in the house of God, when, we, when our love for God grows cold, when there is a lack of motivation and concern for others, we need a revival reign. When secret sins are hidden, we need a revival Reign When an unforgiving spirit and attitude reigns supreme in our hearts, we need a revival reign. When pride will not bow its head to any spiritual authority or the word of God in their life, then it's time for a revival reign. When submission becomes a word that you detest and refuse, then it's time for a revival reign. We need to admit it, confess it, and declare it. I need a revival reign in my heart. 
For like Sardis, we are alive in name only. Like Laodicea, we are paralyzed by self-sufficiency. And like Ephesus, we have left our first love. We need a revival reign that resurrects the things that have lied dormant in our heart for long enough. We need a revival reign that will resurrect the things that have become dead in our spirit that were once alive. We need a revival of convictions. We need a revival of convictions. We need a revival of what's right and what's wrong. What the word says is right and what's wrong. We need a revival. We need the power of the former days to be resurrected in our life again. We need to pray like the old timers prayed until rain starts falling upon us. We need a revival of rain in our life. Restore, O oh Lord, the days of dedication when we served God gladly. Restore, O oh God, the days of faith when we believed God for miracles. Every time we prayed, we expected God to move, O oh God. Restore in us, sweet Jesus, the days when Adonai meant more than amusements, when deity meant more than, di- than diversions, where the Savior meant more than sports. O oh God, awaken and restore in us. Create within us the desire to please you more than the mirror. We desire the childlike faith to look unto you, God, rather than looking for acceptance in this world. We need a revival reign in this hour. We need a revival reign of joy. The joy of the Lord is our strength, is what the Bible says. The reason why some of you can't find joy is because you're looking for joy in every other place but the Lord. But we need a revival reign where we find joy again in him. God, I need revival now. Now. It's dry in our world. It's dusty. You can't hardly see hope right now. It's so dusty. You can't hardly, oh God, if you're looking out there for joy, you're not going to find it. It's a dust cloud out there. If you're looking for hope out there, you're not going to find it. It's too dusty and dark. They called that one Sunday Black Sunday because the cloud, the, the, the dust was so bad that it literally blacked out the sky. Oh God, help us. If we're looking out there, we're not going to see the light. But if you can find him if you can look to him you're gonna find joy there you're gonna find strength there anybody hearing me you're gonna find hope there so we need a revival reign now I can't wait until somebody else gets ready for it I can't wait until the season is just right I can't wait until all the conditions in my life are in alignment. That's the reason why some of you have not experienced victory because you're waiting for things to just be right. If this will happen or if this will happen or if that will happen and God's saying you need a revival rain and if you'll start praying for the rain, all these other things will start coming to life. I need it now. The drought has come. I need the reign of God. I need the glorious reign of revival in my life. Man cannot produce the kind of revival I'm talking about. A preacher can't preach it up in us. A praise team cannot sing it into our lives. No, it comes from heaven. It comes from our hearts. It comes from our hearts seeking heaven. It comes from us pleading with him, send the reign of revival in me. Famed evangelist Billy Sunday was once asked by a woman attending his meetings. She said, why do you keep calling for revival when revival, they don't last? He answered her with this question. Well, why do you keep taking baths? Our world needs a good bath. We need a good bath. We need the rain to settle 
the dusty soil of carnality and fear. We need a heaven sent shower to soothe our minds and calm our doubts and wash away the grit and the grime of worry and stress. And fear that we are facing. I've been praying, come Lord, as the rain fall like the rain in the dust bowls of our hearts and our homes. Transform our dreary worlds into the abundant joy that you have promised us in your word. So let's look at our text. How do our dust clouds become rain clouds? In Hosea's day, God's people were backslidden. And God compared them to a bride who had turned her back on his steadfast love and had prostituted herself before the things of this world. To drive this analogy home, God told Hosea to find and marry a prostitute. He married her, loved her, provided for her, but guess what she did? She ran away to the things and people she thought would bring her happiness. Hosea's response was like God's response to us. For Hosea went looking for this wayward wife. Why? To redeem her, to restore her, and to revive her. Can I just say today that God is in the reviving business, that he's in the restoring business, He runs a salvage yard. The world's trash is heaven's treasure. And Hosea Hosea shows us how God leads people into revival. He shows us how dust clouds are overshadowed with rain clouds. And he reveals how droughts become deluges of rain. Hosea 6.1, we're going to read it again. This first part is my first point. Come and let us return unto the Lord. We need to accept the invitation of God to return back to him. And if you have not recognized it by now, I believe that God has given the greatest altar call that this world has seen in a very long time. We've experienced over the last several months and so many people have missed it. We have buried ourselves into other things trying to divert our attention off of the crisis and on something else instead of coming to God. And so God invites us back to himself for he is the source of life. And he says, come. You don't have to live the life you're living. You don't have to be plagued with the sorrow and the heartache. You don't have to be bothered with the fear and anxiety. Come back to God. Hosea spoke in the plural. He said, let us return. You are not alone. Though millions have come, there's still room always for one more. Regardless of how desperate it seems, no matter how long you've been gone, you can get back on track. Others have and you can. It doesn't matter how long or how little you have served God. If you've gotten off course, God's saying, come back. Come back. Return to me. Return to me. Hosea said return. In other words, it means that at one point in time, we were where we needed to be. But we are no longer. We turned away and we got off course. That blessed word return is used more than a thousand times in the Old Testament alone. In terms of describing what God desires for each of us, this word is used more frequently than almost any other expression. It's a word picture of repentance. Turning to God. Confessing to him our need for him. Hosea uses the word 23 times. And his usage of this word demonstrates not only God's desire for man, but man's reason for not returning. Watch what it says in Hosea 5, 4. Their deeds do not permit them to return to their God. A spirit of prostitution is in their heart. They do not acknowledge the Lord. You see, God's not the problem. 
And we'll blame a whole lot on God. Why didn't God do this or do that or do this? But man's departure from God resides solely upon his shoulders, not God's. Man's current behavior, his deeds, are the very things that prohibit him from following after God. Hosea goes on to say in Hosea 7.10, And the pride of Israel testifieth to his face, and they do not return to the Lord their God nor seek him for all of this. So we've got to ask ourselves today, is my pride the problem? Is my pride the problem as to why I haven't achieved victory, as to why I haven't overcome, as to why God has not answered? Is it my pride? That's not an easy question to ask ourselves, is it? And it proves harder to answer in the affirmative. It is difficult to admit that our proud hearts are parched and dry. It is a hard task to swallow one's pride and return to God. But I'm going to tell you today, we better do it because Hosea 11.5 tells us what happens if not. The Assyrian shall be his king. In other words, the enemy will be your king. Because they refused to return. God's people go into bondage because they refuse to return to God. Can it be that our failures and our habitual addictions are nothing more than the tangible proof or our reluctance to return to God? Thankfully though, God does not leave us in this predicament. For he promises in Hosea 14, 4, through 7, 4 and 7, I will heal their backsliding and I will love them freely. Verse 7, they that dwell under the shadow shall return. They shall revive as the corn and grow as the vine. The scent thereof shall be as the wine of Lebanon. New life comes when we return to God. But we need to accept the invitation. And if we do, revival rain will fall. The word from Hosea goes forward. Hosea 6.1. Come and let us return unto the Lord. Watch this. For he hath torn and he will heal us. He hath smitten and he will bind us up. That word torn and smitten is not... Not easy words to hear, and it's more difficult to live. And that leads me to the second point that he made, is that we've got to embrace crisis when it comes. I'm not saying that we we embrace the pandemic. I'm not saying don't misread. I'm simply saying our walk with God is not without ups and downs. And in the scripture, the promised land was a picture of the victorious walk. For in Deuteronomy 8, 7, the Lord said, The land I send to you is one of hills and what? Valleys. There will be tremendous highs. There will be tremendous lows. And in those moments of transitions between the two, in those times of crisis, God's at work. For Colossians 2, 6 It tells us, As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him. How did we receive Christ? Most received him in a crisis experience. Most received them, him when they had hit bottom or when they had realized that I can't do this on my own. We did not just happen upon him. God took us from hurt to healing, from crisis to faith. He allowed us to be torn that he may make us whole. And the word torn here is the seizing of prey in a predator's teeth. Our wandering from God put us in the teeth of opposition. We've been taken, we've been shaken, we've been shredded, we've been torn. But our, pre- our pain is a precursor to God's healing, to God's approach. We often want the healing without the tearing. Job 5, 17 through 18 says, Behold, happy is the man whom God corrects. Therefore despise not thou the chastening of the Almighty. For he makes sore and binds up. He wounds and his hands make whole. 
In the crisis, God works to cause us to get sick of the desert of disobedience. And I believe that during this time, I'm not saying God brought the pandemic upon us, but during this time that we've been in, and during the unrest in our world, God is giving that altar call and is saying, are y'all noticing what's going on here? Is anybody going to look to me? Is anybody going to call on my name? Is there anybody that's tired of the desert of disobedience and will cry out for rain? Oh yeah, a physician breaks bones to set them properly. And so the great physician allows crisis to come into our life sometimes to heal us. Because it's the only way you can get our attention most of the time. There is a purpose in the pain. And this pain is only for a specific amount of time. For God promised that he would revive us. And that revival will come. As the rain. If you keep reading, it says in Hosea 6 2, after two days, he will revive us. In the third day, he will raise us up and we shall live in his sight. Then shall we know if we follow on to know the Lord. His going forth is prepared as the morning and he shall come unto us as the rain, as the latter and former rain unto the earth. And that leads me to my final point. We need to anticipate revival. We need to anticipate the rain coming. In 1839, James Epsey claimed that rain could be produced by heating the air. His plan to bring rain to a parched farmland involved building huge log fires across the American West. But guess what? It didn't work. Later, another theory was tested in Texas. Robert Dyronforth believed that loud noises would bring rain. So he blasted cannons at the sky. But guess what? No rain came. Can I just say heat and noise won't bring the rain we need? Red faces and fervor won't bring it either. Revival isn't just shouting, it's also weeping. It's also a travailing in prayer. Revival isn't crowds, but rather individuals reaching out for God. Revival does not begin in the atmosphere, but in the hearts of people. Thirsty hearts find God. God will come as the rain to each heart that seeks Him. In Palestine, there are two periods of rain called the former and the latter in the Scripture. The former is associated with the planting of crops in the spring. But the latter rain is associated with harvesting of the crops in the fall. Can I just tell you, good people, the harvest is coming. There's going to be a great ingathering of the harvest in the last days. We need the latter rain. God will come in abundance. He will water our lives. But we need to expect it. Elijah told his servant to come looking for the cloud. His anticipating of the rainfall in faith provoked a response. Provoke your rainfall in your life. Don't just settle for a dusty, cold, carnal heart. But provoke your rainfall. Come back to God. Embrace the trial. And then look for your promise. Look for the rain cloud that God has promised you will come. Oh, you didn't get that. I said you need to come back to God. You need to embrace the trial. But then you need to anticipate. And you need to provoke the rainfall in your life by saying, I know it's coming. I'm going to pray until it comes. I'm going to believe until it happens. Woo. When your victory is incomplete... When unbelievers are asking where your God is, when you seek to break a family pattern of destruction, when debt is mounting and income is low, provoke your rainfall. When the Lazarus of your destiny is enshrouded and buried, when the road you travel becomes rougher and tougher, when you become an expert at finishing what you should not have started, when you try to smile but your face will not cooperate, when your nose is bleeding and your eyes are blackened in life's boxing ring, come back to God. Embrace the crisis and provoke your rainfall. 
anticipate it. Look for it. God, you've given me a word. Rain's coming. I'm looking for it. Anticipate it. Provoke it through your anticipation. Believe it. Confess it. Claim it. Pray until it happens. Worship through it all. Dig ditches in your valleys and prepare for rain. After that terrible dust storm in April, on April 14th, 1935, a news reporter said that three words were on the lips of every farmer in the Great Plains. If it rains. You know what they were saying? If it will only rain, all of this will be taken care of. If it would just rain. For the people of faith, the word should be when it rains. When the rain comes, my family will be okay. When the rain comes, my job will work out. When the rain comes, my prayer will be answered. When the rain comes, healing will flow in my body. When the rain comes, my lost loved one will return back to God. When the rain comes on this dry and thirsty heart, restoration will come. Healing will flow. Peace will come. Strength will come. I hear the sound of an abundance of rain. But I wonder if anybody else in this house hears what I'm hearing. I wonder, is there anybody else in this place and watching online in your living room that can hear what I'm hearing? Oh, somebody needs to cry out. Fall like the rain, Lord. Help us to open our hearts as you open the windows of heaven and let it rain on us right now.